Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name is Dave Marshall and you're listening to episode 141 on the Bolka Fish with Dr. Valentina Rossi of University College Cork. If this is your first time listening to PaleoCast, then I offer you a very warm welcome. At PaleoCast, we want to give you the most accurate portrayal of the field of paleontology as possible. Now that's a fairly large remit as it includes everything that we know about the whole history of life on Earth. So some weeks we'll be discussing bacterial mounds, other weeks we'll be looking at the teeth of extinct ferrets or something I don't know. Now that will include dinosaurs, but we're not just limited to dinosaurs, and so that's one of the things that really sets us apart. But with so much to discuss, we'll sometimes get into a lot of detail and it's easy to leave new listeners behind, especially if you're new to terms like taphonomy, melanosomes, or even phylogenetic bracketing. So if you ever find that there's something you don't understand, you're probably not the only one. Leave us a comment and we'll do our very best to explain it. Speaking of taphonomy, I've just done three months of intense documentary research and it feels like my brain is a tiny carbonaceous film splattered on the inside of my skull. But hopefully I'll have a lot more time and mental space to be working on all of my various projects again soon. In the meantime, if you've not been getting enough of a paleo fix, we've been promoting other shows in our paleo podcast plug. And today is the turn of the Jurassic Park cast. My name's Ryan Rogers, and I'm a big, dumb Jurassic Park fan. Join me on the Jurassic Park cast, the Jurassic Park podcast where guests chat with me about Michael Crichton's 1990 novel, Jurassic Park. And also not that, too. If you also like Michael Crichton's 1990 novel, Jurassic Park, remember reading it, wonder about how it fits with the movies or what chaos theory was really all about then this podcast may be for you. You can join me as I tackle a new chapter, address the mistakes I made in the previous episodes, share some dinosaur news, and invite a terrific and forthcoming new guest each week by searching for Jurassic Park Cast. It's supposed to sound like both Sick Podcast and Jurassic Park at the same time, and the hyphens are where you'd expect them to be. If you want to read along in the book, add some thoughts to what we've been discussing on the show, or be a guest on the show and chat with me about anything you like about Jurassic Park, you can do that by connecting with me. I'm at ryansrogers at gmail.com. We can rehash, tear down, gush over, and chit-chat about any part of the book, or also not the book, all you'd like. Thank you dearly for your consideration of listening to the Jurassic Park cast, the Jurassic Park podcast where we talk about the novel Jurassic Park, and also not that too. So, please check them out. I hear that they might be having a very interesting guest on quite soon. Something else we've got cooked up for you is a guest episode of PaleoCast. So one of my Paleo buddies is going to interview another of my Paleo buddies, and that's two fresh Paleo perspectives for the price of one. I figure we have this awesome platform and an awesome community, so let's share it and everyone benefits. So. If you're similarly a paleontologist and you've got an idea about someone you could interview, get in touch. I'd love to hear your idea. And as always, we've got pictures that accompany this episode on our website where you can feast your eyes on some of these beautiful fossils and likes, shares, comments, reviews, ratings, anything you can do for us on social media all really helps us out a lot. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, Valentina. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. So we like to get to know our interviewees a tiny bit before we get into the scientific detail. So how did you get into the field of paleontology? So that was, I think I kind of fell into it when I started university. Um, I started my undergraduate in geological sciences uh, because I thought I was very passionate about, you know, rocks and volcanoes and, you know, uh, climate and all of that. Uh, And then after the first few lessons uh, of paleontology and we were doing like, you know, kind of, uh, you know, the theory of evolution and we were starting to look at fossils, I felt just there was love for sight um and after that i basically these things kept growing on me so i decided maybe i could do this for living and i kept going with my bachelor thesis in paleontology and then i did a master also in paleontology and uh, and now uh, you know after my phd i'm still in paleontology 
Okay, and what have you specialized in? So uh, for my PhD, I specialized in exceptional preservation, which is basically the preservation of anything else that it's not bones, teeth, and all those are tissues. So basically soft tissues uh, like skin, organs, uh, eye spots, and specifically also pigments. So I... I think I have like a deep knowledge now of melanin, which is this pigment that gives colors of our hair, skin, eyes, and also gives a lot of colors to uh, different organisms. And I apply these to also fossils. Okay. So how did you end up focused on that? Because obviously you said that you fell into it in the undergrad. You don't learn about the the preservation of uh, pigments in fossils then where you, you normally just learn about brachiopods or maybe a dinosaur or two uh, did you uh, were you interested in when you saw these projects advertised you were like that is exactly what i think i should be working on or did it did it again did you just fall into it and then eventually fall in love with that subsection of the field yeah, so the short answer is yes, I basically fell into it. And specifically, I was looking for a PhD project and my boyfriend sent me the advertisement for, you know, the application for this project. Um, and, you know, he said to me like, oh my God, you know, you, you love evolution, you love vertebrates, you know, you love everything about, you know, the depth part of biology that you, you can't really do on fossils, but it looks like that maybe you could do it on fossils. So why don't you apply for this PhD position? And I was kind of like, oh my God, you know, I don't have the, the expertise. I, you know, I never done this before. I know very little about autonomy and I know even less about pigments and chemistry so I will never be selected but then obviously you know everybody and my boyfriend specifically pushed me like you know try it you know because you never know and I fell into it <laughs> I was selected and and then I accepted the position because yeah the project was very you know very new very uh, interesting and I learned a lot since then and boom it was just you were up to your neck in chemistry, I expect. Yes, it was. It was a very steep, uh, you know, uh, curve. Uh, the learning point because obviously I literally had zero knowledge of you know the organic chemistry or even you know pigment and biology. All of that for me was really new. Uh, my undergraduate was was uh, you know geology, so we we didn't do any biology at all. Um, but that, I think that was the part that I was more more interested in at that point. You know, I, I wanted to learn more, and that was very useful because I, I was never bored. Every day it was something new to read. Uh, you know, obviously all the literature. Uh, you know, I, I could learn more about uh, different type of organisms and also about obviously the fossil record because in in Italy I think it's the same for you know the bachelor. You know, the paleontology modules are all kind of the same. You do more invertebrates or, yes, a lot of brachiopods, a lot of bivalves, you know, ammonites. Then there might be a module, you know, on dinosaur evolution, but those are sometimes are rare. So I, I didn't know anything about soft tissue preservation. So that was really, really interested. And I was really, really happy with that. Okay, so you're an Italian researcher, and in this episode, we're going to be talking about your work on Italian fossils. But you are based at uh, the University College Cork in Ireland. So why is this the best place for you to do your research? So, so this was like basically for this specific project that we're going to talk about today, uh, one of the requirements was that I had to... Uh, study the fossils or the samples of the fossil abroad. Uh, so the, the fossil has to be Italian or you have to have a, an Italian institution behind, but then you have to collaborate with someone else abroad. And this kind of to, to have a connection with other institutions as well, which I think is really, really interesting as a uh, type of project. And obviously, I, I picked UCC uh, because I did my PhD here, but also I knew already that we have all the equipment and obviously, uh, you know, they were a team already expert in uh, fossil color and also soft tissue preservation. So it was a good place for me to have a mentoring scheme as well on the topic and to have the right support. 
So that was with, I'm guessing, Professor McNamara, Maria McNamara. Yes, yes exactly. Yes, which she was like one of the first people we interviewed on Paleocast. Oh, on great. <laughs> polarization in the fossil record. I think it was something like episode six or something. Oh my God. Just completely off the top of my head. Be interesting to see just how far you know, the field has come since that time, which would have been like 11 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but today we're going to be talking about the Bolkard Lagerstätte in Italy. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about it, please? Yes. So the Bolkard Lagerstätte is uh, placed in northern Italy. It's nearby the city of Verona um, and it's in the, in the Lessini Mountains range. Um, it's a very beautiful location. It's a very, it, you know, there is a little town there that hosts this magnificent museum. And nearby the village, there are different outcrops. So there are rocks exposed where you can find a lot of different fossils. And it's called a Lagerstätte, which this is a, a German um, word that basically means for, for us, it means exceptional preservation. So when you see the word Lagerstätte, it means that there, there are very special fossils. And those fossils have not only sometimes complete skeletons, fully articulated, but they also have soft tissues that are preserved. So you can find evidence of the skin, the eye spots, um, internal organs, stomach content, and also, you know, you might actually find traces of the pigments and the coloration, which is you know, the topic uh, that I wanted to explore with, with, with my project. Um, in terms of geology, like geological age, we are talking about the Eocene. So the, the rocks and the fossils are more or less 48 millions of years old. And in terms of the environment they represent, we are in under the sea. So Bolka was this um, restricted lagoon uh, with probably some reef as well, very close to land. Um, so it's a, imagine like, I don't know, the Caribbean, for example, or like some very hot tropical sea where you would like to go on holiday. That was Bolka <laughs> in the Eocene. I would like to go on holiday in Bolka in the Eocene, and I would like to go on holiday in Bolka in the present day. Uh, how nice, have you actually been to the outcrops uh, to Bolka itself? No, I never, I never went. Uh, I'm planning a trip to uh, Bolka uh, in September, so hopefully I might have some time to, to go ahead and have a look. Uh, I know that one of the outcrops, uh, people can go and visit it, because now I think it's, like, it's, a, it's a geopark, it's actually a candidate for the UNESCO uh, geosites. So hopefully in the you know, few years, we might know if we're going to have a new UNESCO site in, in Italy. Uh, but obviously, you know, uh, digging is forbidden. We, you, we, you need to be part of the team uh, of the museum and the universities. Uh, fair enough. Uh, it sounds exciting, though. I'd love to go. Um, mm. But what kinds of organisms are found there? You said it's marine, uh, lagoonal, so I'm guessing fish. Yes, yeah, so uh, like Bolka, it's very famous for the fish fauna, mostly. But there, there are also sharks, skates, uh, there are loads of invertebrates, like there are little arthropods, both marine and terrestrial, which is very interesting. And also oh, there are plenty of plants, uh, which again gives it you, gives the image of this marine environment, which also was pretty close to land, because we do find marine fauna and also terrestrial fauna together. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, how diverse are the fishes? Because if we're talking something equatorial and a, a gorgeous Caribbean kind of environment with reefs and stuff, would it be absolutely? jam-packed with like thousands of different species yes so so far uh i think they've been described um, almost 200 species of wow. different species so it's obviously it's very very diverse we go from like you know small sardine like fishes from you know and to i don't know like angel uh or batfish i don't know how what the english Prefer like in Italian, mm -hmm. we will call it angel fish, and those are very big, big, massive fishes with these beautiful fins, and those also preserve color patterns. So it's very, very excited, uh, exciting from that point of view. Yeah, 
Uh, I guess they look like angels, both to Italians and to the okay, English. Yeah, I, yeah. I found it on Google that sometimes they're called batfish, which was a bit weird. <laughs> well, bats, angels, can you really tell the yeah, difference? Yeah, they have wings and it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, do I want to talk about disparity? Mm, probably. Oh, yeah. mm, too technical for me. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, and how good is the preservation at that site? You've you've already mentioned that it's a uh, a preservation Lagerstätte. Yeah. So yeah, the preservation is it's it's impressive. You know, it's incredible. Of course, you know the level of preservation varies through the succession. So there are layers, for example, where uh, I know, um, you know, we found mostly disarticulated skeleton. So it means that probably there was more high energy environment. But then there are layers and layers where the fishes or you know the sharks or any invertebrates are fully complete articulated with soft tissues like just to give you an idea of the quality there are few small very small squids that are perfectly preserved even though you know perfectly is not the right word but they are beautifully preserved um with even the ink sac still preserved and in place you know uh, so that's amazing because those soft-bodied organisms rarely enter in the fossil record and we rarely find them uh, with such uh, fidelity of preservation. Okay, so with the fish, what is there actually to preserve other than, I guess, the bones and some scales? What's what's there if we look at a, a typical bulker fish? So uh, you can find uh, the evidence of the pigmentation, uh, which is often associated, obviously, with the full skeleton. Um, and you can find the eye spot, which is also pigmented. And in some cases, you can even find the internal organs in the abdomen that they're still preserved and in, together with the uh, stomach content. So obviously, you can, you can learn a lot about these ancient fishes by looking at a fossil. Wow. So with the coloration... Okay, what, what is it that's actually being preserved there? So here, what's preserved, it's the melanosomes, which are melanin granules. Uh, so those are cell organelles that in life produce melanin pigments. And we found them in the skin uh, of the fishes, but also obviously other uh, vertebrates. And also we found it in the eye spot, so in the, in the tissues of the eyes. Okay, so this is something that's actually within a cell. Yes, exactly. It's within the cells of, or within layer of the skin, for example, or layers in the tissues of the eyes. Okay, so do you actually have skin cells preserved? No. So from many of the specimens I saw, we don't have anything else preserved of the uh, of the skin, apart from the scales, of course, but from the internal layer of the skin, we find only melanosomes. So, for example, in, in many fish species, there are also other pigments that obviously contribute to the final con coloration that we actually see. But so far, and from what I know, in fishes, they have not been um, detected, you know, cons consistently. We found almost always melanosomes, so we can only infer the melanin-based coloration. Okay, just I'm, I'm just a little bit stuck on the preservation and explaining that. Mm -hmm. How can you get things being preserved that are subcellular without the actual cells themselves being preserved? Why, why does this organelle preserve when nothing else does? Yeah, so this is a really, really good question. And the simple answer is that melanin, it's a very, very resistant molecule, okay? So it's a macromolecule, so it's a molecule that has a very complex chemistry, and it's also a polymer. So it's made of different bits of other molecules that together are extremely strong. So it's very difficult to degrade or even destroy melanin. Like you need something that can be produced in a lab, but it doesn't necessarily happen in nature. Uh, so this is why melanosomes, we think they get preserved more often, obviously under certain special conditions, okay? Um, and this is why we found it, where everything else decay away or simply do not preserve or do not you know, resist long enough to get preserved. Okay, and what is the link between melanosomes and coloration? 
So the link here is that basically when we found melanosomes in an integument, so the skin, for example, in the case of the fish I studied, we obviously have to look at the um, spatial distribution, okay? Because obviously if you find a patch of melanosomes in a fossil, it, you know, it doesn't mean that that's representative. So we need to do a little bit of, you know, investigation to see, okay, where, like how, how extensive was the melanin or the melanosome layer of the skin? Do we see any pattern that it's repetitive that could be representative of the pattern in life? Or is this a taphonomic artifact? So maybe we have found a patch, but there was not a real patch in life. It's just that this part was preserved better. And the best thing to do is always to look at the part and counterpart of a fossil. So when you split the rock, you have basically two faces to see. And if that same patch is preserved in both sides, okay, that could be a real pattern. But if it's not preserved, then you might have a problem. It could be just a taphonomic artifact. So something like, like that makes obvious sense. If, you, if you're talking about eye spots and you've got a big blob of black, then obviously the, the pigmentation in the eye is still there in the right place. But say, for example, if you had um, a pattern where like the front half of a fish is all black, that could suggest more that there's, there's something going on with the preservation where the front half of the fish is preserved with its pigment, whereas the back half might have been completely black as well, but we just don't have that preserved. So yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Um, but then I'm, I'm here talking about black. Obviously, the the pigment in eyes is often black, uh, but then animals are completely different colors. Um, so is there any way to tell what color any given evidence of pigment would be so with fossils the only you know uh, robust scientific evidence that we have it's the melanin and in invertebrates melanosomes can have different shapes um, and you know especially in birds uh, you could potentially be able to recognize different colors or different hues for example so you might be able in birds to see you know, to differentiate between, I don't know, a black feather, a gray feather, and a, an orange feather, or feathers that have, for example, um, an, um, a structural color. But in fish and other, um, or like amphibians and reptiles, that's a little bit more complicated because unfortunately melanosomes seems to have an ovoid or like almost, yeah, an ovoidal shape, uh, which is not indicative when any specific color is just the shape of the melanosomes um, and on top of that you do have many other pigments like i don't know carotenoids for example or you know crystal of guanines that obviously contribute to the final coloration so if for certain organisms in, in this particular case in birds you will you might be able to have you know you to infer different colors uh, but again from brown to gray to red, not many more, and maybe bluish colorations. But in fishes, for example, that would be very, very difficult because so far we have we have evidence only for round slash ovoidal melanosomes. So the shape of the melanosome dictates the color of pigment in birds, at least. Yes, yes. Okay. So we, we've got a bit more of a limited palette with fishes. Exactly. Unless, you you know, if we find a different type of preservation, so where we have maybe the whole skin that is mineralized, uh, you might have some uh, preservation of other pigment cells. But so far, at least, I, I know that that happened only for a fossil snake, that it's not from Volca. So. Yeah, well, hopefully we can do something with the limited palettes that we have available to us but what kinds of things do fish use color for and i mean just in general yeah so basically uh i mean fish can use use the color for display of course and this is all of this that i'm gonna say now actually is valid for basically every animal alive today <laughs> obviously you know display and signaling so you know you want to show yourself to your fellows of you know of your 
you know, whatever population species and, you know, you want to show, look, I'm healthy and I'm beautiful. Look at my colors. Uh, of course, you can also maybe want to hide yourself. So you said, no, don't look at me. Look, I'm blending completely in the environment. I'm invisible. Um, and these are the most obvious function of color. Uh, but obviously there are, there is also a protective function. For example, melanin uh, pigments are really good uh, shields against uh, UV radiations, cosmic radiations that we don't think about that very often, but for very, you know, more, uh, let's say, simple organisms, cosmic radiation are a problem <laughs> as much as UV radiation. So having melanin pigments around in, in the external part of the body, in the skin, it's very, very useful. And also melanin, it's able to capture heavy metals or toxic uh, chemical compounds that can arm the cell and also the DNA. So it's a, it's a great chemical shield as well. It does seem very important to organisms. Yes, it is. And it's incredible that we can find traces of melanin pigments or melanosomes in general uh, in the fossil record. It gives you, know, it gives you uh, a complete total, you know, a more, I don't know, I feel like a deep... I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm just in love with melanin. I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> it's just incredible, you know, that, that you find, you find something so important today, uh, even from human health, you know, there is so much research on this and you find it in the fossil record in an organism that ex is extinct or lived, I don't know, 50 million years ago. Uh, and you, are you able to study it? So it is, I don't, I don't know. I feel it's very cool. Okay. So, um, yeah, we've talked about the, I guess the exterior yeah. of the fish, but um, as we were mentioning before about the eyes, uh, they have melanin in them. Mel I can't say that; that's a tongue twister. They have melanin in them. Uh, do fish or us or any other animal have any other tissues that are melanized? Yes. So vertebrates have uh, melanosomes also inside the internal organs. So this is, is commonly named or called internal melanin. Um, and for a very long time, this was kind of like, you know, it was reported in, you know, uh, medical research or more bi biological research. And now we actually know that internal melanin can fossilize and can give us a, a lot more information about the internal anatomy of fossils, which is something that, again, rarely we can explore. So if you're lucky enough and a specimen or a species overall has melanized internal organs, we might be able to find it also in the fossil. And what we do here is basically we need to, uh, you know, study the morphology of the melanosomes. We have to do a lot of stats uh, and, you know, Unfortunately, statistical analysis is important. And mm -hmm. also we can use the chemistry of the melanosomes to also differentiate between those that belong to the skin and those that belong to different organs. Um, and I suppose the interesting part here is, again, the function of an internal melanin. Because, again, in the exterior of the organism, it makes sense to have a color. Okay, or something that produces a color because it means that you can be either very visible or invisible. You can kind of display that you are very healthy, so you're ready for the mating season and all of that part. But obviously, inter an internal pigment doesn't make any sense because what's the function of an internal pigment? It Look at my beautiful kidney. Exactly. You know, Look at my you're probably not healthy. very fit. <laughs> yes. So the... Here, there is this protective function. So melanin, now we are more aware that melanin is a sink for metals and, again, to bind all of those chemical compounds that actually naturally formed in our body during our you know, daily metabolism, basically. And there are those toxic compounds that have to be binded or they have to be you know, disposed somehow. And it seems that melanin, in, specifically internal melanin, does that as primary job. Um, so would that be why like, the liver and the kidney and these other blood filtering organis oh, organisms, organs, are a bit darker? Exactly. Yeah. So in, in, in actually those organs, we do find a lot of melanin stored. And, and it's interesting because, again, from a biological point of view, you know, we can study this character in modern animal and then we can also find 
the, the internal melanin fossilized in fossils and can give us, again, an understanding of the evolution of this character. And we might be able to understand better the function as well of internal melanin over the geological time. So externally, you gave a couple of examples of how uh, this coloration is used. How strong is the link between that coloration and color patterns and the ecology of a fish, how it lives? Yeah, so for fishes, this seems to be a pretty strong link. Um, and again, we know this by observing uh, model animals, so model fishes uh, that we can either observe, obviously, in, in the lab or in aquarium, but also in the wild. And it seems that there are specific type of color patterns depending on where the, the fish lives, so the environment and the habitat in general, and also the mode of life. So, for example, if the fish lives together with other uh, fishes of the same species, so they form this like a school, it's called, um, or if the fish, for example, lives in open waters or in, you know, in a more sheltered environment. And in some cases, even though here the link is not as straightforward as for the other one that I'm going to talk in a minute, uh, there, there are some links between the feeding strategy or the diet of the animal and or the fish and the, um, and the color pattern. So, for example, we know that uh, a stripe pattern, so when you have uh, those lines that are uh, horizontal on the back of the fish, the fish lives in an open environment. Those are called technically unstructured habitats. So basically, just imagine that you have the bottom of the sea or a lake, but then there is nothing else around where this fish lives. So there are no caves, no rocks, or there are no many, I don't know, algae and plants. So basically, the fish cannot hide anywhere. So the strike pattern seems to help him hide better. But also, if those fish lives in schools, so they live together with other members of the same species, they can use the stripes of the neighbor, of the neighbor to orientate themselves. So they use it as a reference point. And I feel like this is really, really interesting. And if instead you have a fish with spots uh, or a very complex pattern, there are some fishes from the uh, from coral reef, for example, they have very complex geometric patterns. And again, that seems a, a something in between the fact that they can again they have so much stuff where they can where they can um, hide themselves. So they have corals, they have rocks, they have caves. There are other big and smaller fishes as well. So they can hide easily, even though they have a very colorful and very complex pattern that to us seems very obvious, but it doesn't mean that it's obvious for other fishes. Um, and again, there is the other link where if you have a striped fish, very often those fish eat other fish. So they are perceivers in, in terms of feeding strategy. Um, and basically that's it. It'd be nice to have a quiz, you know, on Instagram or something. Name the oh, ecology. Yeah. I mean, that's actually a good idea. I'm full of good ideas. <laughs> um, you can have that one. Oh, we can, we can co-run it. We can organize it, Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'll let you do all the work. Okay. <laughs> right. So I'm sure everyone has followed along with that and knows exactly where this interview is going. So in your latest research paper, you have been discussing the color patterns of a moonfish. Uh, can you tell us what a moonfish is first? Yes. So, okay. So a moonfish, I feel like it's a very broad term to describe every fish in the world that are very flattened and they might have very big fins, uh, kind of like the angel fish, basically. Uh, the, the moonfish that I studied in, again, the common name is razor moonfish. Um, but we call it moonfish because I feel like nobody will know exactly what a razor moonfish is. So we're going to go with the moonfish because I think it's easier. Um, in, in detail, like the technical name of the fish, so the species name is Mene Rombea, or Rombea, depending on to who you talk. And it's, uh, the, it's part of the family Menide, which again, it's one of the family that it's uh, comprised within the moonfish uh, big group. Okay. And 
out of all the fishes at Balka, 200 species, why, why did you choose to study this one? So again, this was like found uh, in a new excavation that took place just before the pandemic. So at the end of uh, 2019, um, and at that time, uh, I you know I I met my collaborators, the Italian collaborators, uh, at a conference the summer before, um, and uh, we talk about oh my god, you know you study fossil pigments, fossil melanin, you know do you know polka? And I'm like, yes, of course I know, and it would be lovely to study an Italian specimen uh, but obviously I was kind of finishing up my PhD so there was no space for me to add more data so we decided to keep this kind of like hanging there like when you have time you know come talk to us and we can see what we can do and I think it was January 2020 when this colleague of mine sent me a picture of this newly excavated moonfish and said like look what we found in our latest excavation and I said oh my god I want to study that let's <laughs> write a project on this. <laughs> so this is how it happened. <laughs> how well do we actually know moonfish in general? So we actually know moonfishes really well because we have modern species still alive today. So uh, for us, you know, it, it's rare that sometimes, you know, we don't have anything relative alive to the fossils. But th in this case, I was lucky enough that we have a species from the same family that still swim freely um, in the Indian Ocean. Okay, and can we see or say anything about the link between coloration and ecology in those moonfish, in the extant ones? Yes, so in, it's interesting because the extant species um, has a different color pattern than the fossil. So the modern one has black spots or blotches. So those are kind of like a spotty pattern, but not very regular on its back. And then as a very light colored belly, almost white. Um, in terms of like body plan, so the shape of the fish is identical to the fossil one. And actually, uh, when I was starting this project, I basically Googled moonfish because I, I didn't really know what they were. Um, and there is an x-ray image of the skeleton of a modern moonfish and a fossil one from Volca, and they are identical. Like you couldn't, you couldn't know which one was the fossil and which one was the modern, which is really, really interesting then knowing that the color pattern and the ecology is actually different in the fossil. Um, so the, the modern moonfish have, as I said, these black blotches uh, on the on the back, and then they they have kind of like a darker background behind these very dark blotches, and then they the 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 color kind of change toward uh, almost white in the belly. So they're counter shaded basically. And what we know about their ecology is that they are restricted in the Indian and Pacific Ocean. They actually seem to be very famous in terms of like uh, Asian cuisine. People eat those fishes regularly in Asia. Um, and so because of this, there, there are actually, you know, obviously a lot of studies uh, in terms of like, you know, um, the, the fisheries and, you know, and the protective areas and all of that part. So we know, for example, that they, lead, they prefer to live in coastal waters, pretty shallow, and they eat invertebrates and plankton on the bottom of the, of the coast. So basically, you know, small benting invertebrates and, and plankton. Uh, and again, this is interesting because, you know, we could potentially, if we find, and we did, found the stomach content of fossil moonfish, we can then see if there is a difference in the diet as well. Well, we're jumping ahead. <laughs> I want to know about Sorry. the the link between its color patterns, the modern ones, and its ecology. What is it about those spots that helps it live the way that it does? So honestly, <laughs> I don't know. Um, because again, on, on this, on these species, we know where the, where it lives. So these coastal waters, uh, sometimes, you know, they, they've been seen close to the reef in Australia, but they don't seem to live there. So they live in, in different parts of this Indo-Pacific ocean. Uh, and the link here between, uh, ecology and spots is not clear, unfortunately. So I don't know if you want to put this in the, uh, I have no problem with not knowing. Yeah, because you know, I think it's important. 
I mean, they, they, we literally don't know. Um, and there is more about the genetics as well, where we, we kind of discussed that in the paper, but obviously it's a lot of inferences. So um, there could be like a mutation that happened at some point that triggered the change from stripes to spots. And there is no link then necessarily between the ecology and the color. Yeah, but whatever it is, uh, you know, it's not, it's, it's working for them. It's not selecting against them if no, they're exactly, successful. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. spots it is, why not? Yeah. Um, so the fossil one, Mene Rombea, how well known is it from Bolka? Is it all over the place? Is it super rare? So no, Mene Rombea, it's actually very, uh, it, it, you know, all my colleagues, they call it like the an iconic fossil from Borka because they, they found it tons of, of Mene Rombea. You know, there are hundreds of hundreds of specimens and most of them are fully articulated. A uh, few of them also have the color pattern preserved. So here, for example, we know for sure the color pattern of this, of, of Mene Rombea because we have many uh, specimens. And and what is that color pattern? So the color pattern that we uh, reconstructed basically in, in our study is that we know that the, the back, so the, the fossil was countershaded, which means that it had a dark back and a light colored uh, belly or abdomen. And also on the back, also there were three very prominent stripes. So they're highly visible in the hand specimen. So we think that those were very visible as well in, in when the animal was alive, basically. So with the patterns so immediately obvious, is that just the end of the story? You just kind of drew them down and recorded where they were? Or did you have to do any sort of lab work to determine that it definitely was here and not anywhere else? So, I mean, I had to do some work, of course, because I still had to prove or demonstrate that those stripes were made of some sort of pigment and they weren't just there. Uh, of course, the fact that we have thousands of specimens with the same pattern helped a lot. Uh, so <laughs> basically what I had to do, it was just, you know, put us you know, a couple of samples uh, under an electron microscope. And when I found that there were melanosomes, then I did some chemical analysis to kind of support the idea that those were melanin, um, you know, that there was melanin preserved and that was it. The other important thing was try to check, double check that the abdomen uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the fish was not pigmented because obviously there could be important in terms of behavior and ecology. So basically I needed to, to check that I didn't have any internal melanin contributing to the color of the abdomen. Okay, speaking of internal melanin, you found some. How much of a surprise was that? Was it something that you were looking for? So I, it was a little bit of a surprise because I... I studied internal melanin for my PhD, but I, I wasn't studying internal melanin in fishes specifically. So I, I did found some papers during my PhD. They were talking about internal pigmentation in fishes, but obviously I didn't know how, how widespread that was. So the, when I saw those black patches in the abdomen on, of the specimen I was studying, I was like, hmm, let me check for internal melanin. So I basically, I had a couple of months of reading loads of papers about fish, you know, biology and physiology, and I found out that internal melanin is pretty common in fishes, actually. So then I had to do the usual analysis, and yes, I those were internal melanosomes. And I was happy, because that was something new for me. Okay, that sounds like a, an enthralling few months reading about fish organs. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and During the yes. pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so, yeah, we've, we've found their internal organs. What kind of organs were you able to identify? And how was it possible to distinguish the internal ones from the external ones? Could it not be as ridiculous as it sounds that they just have kind of like a little heart or a little liver shaped spot <laughs> as part of their coloration on the outside. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
still possible, <laughs> but no. Um, so the, the, the first thing uh, for internal melanin is location and thickness of the melanosome layer. So the, the melanosomes in the internal organs are very abundant um, and they are very localized. As you said, like, you know, the liver have melanosomes or the kidney has melanosomes, the heart can have melanosomes. And if you have a fossil that you see that is not being disturbed during decay or during maturation, so you have all the bones perfectly articulated, you can assume that, uh, you know, a spot in the abdomen that is very thick, packed full of melanosomes with a different shape from those that you find in a place that is definitely the integument. Those has to be internal melanosomes, okay? You, you know, everything points out to that. Obviously, internal melanosomes do not, do not have the shape of the organ because those can be very localized in particular site of the organ. Uh, but for example, for the kidney, uh, the head kidney in particular in fishes is heavily melanized. And in, in many moonfish specimens from Bolka, there is a tiny elongated patch of melanin or melanosomes in this case, just below the vertebral column. And it's so well aligned and it's so specific of the region that that's the, for example, the melanosome from the kidney. And obviously I knew, I know this now, but I didn't know at the time. So I had to do all the stats and all the analysis to be sure of what I'm looking for. Yes. Uh, head kidneys are a new one for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad they have kidneys in their head and it works for them. <laughs> it's not where I would be looking. But, no, exactly. uh, did, did these organs correspond to the modern one? I mean, if we look on a plate around it, the Indian Ocean, if we cut open that fish, is was it all in the same places? Yes, exactly. Yeah, they would be in the exact same places. Again, I couldn't dissect an, a moonfish because they're not readily you know, available in our European shops. Uh, but again, there are loads of videos and, you know, kind of like bloody and full of gore papers about fish dissections. So I was able to kind of like indirectly um see that yes the position was the same as in the fossil yes well that's uh kind of an emphatic answer but yeah. i am quite satisfied <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> okay so we've got our color patterns on our fossil moonfish what does it mean for our interpretation of their paleoecology yes so this was a very a very interesting interesting part of my project because again as I said I I didn't really know moonfishes before I started um, so I had to like really go through the literature and try to understand the work that was being done and what did we know already and it was stunning to see that obviously we have clear differences between a fossil moonfish in terms of the color pattern, of course, and a modern one. And fair enough, those two species, obviously, they did not not live at the same time or space. Uh, so it makes sense, right, that they might have different color patterns, especially when we think about fishes that, you know, they, they reproduce very quickly and they could have, you know, there could be so many different mutations that can affect the actual color pattern that it makes sense in the geological time scale to see this shift. But what, for the first time, we were able to see that and report that for sure, together with other evidence, for example, the stomach content. So here we have a striped fish that has the evidence of its last meal that was a tiny sardine-like fish. So a big fish eating another small fish with a striped pattern, which makes total sense when we know that Pichivorous fishes do have stripes on their back. Were you able to reconstruct the the food chain at Bolka in any way? Like, do we do we know where Mene Rambea sits in this? So, what we know, it was definitely, obviously, at this point, uh, probably a predator, or at least, obviously, was eating other small fishes. But they were much bigger fish that were eating the moon fish. So we definitely know that, that it was kind of sitting in, in, in the middle, I suppose. So we have our two moonfish that we've discussed. We have the modern one and we have the fossil one. And they have different feeding strategies, different camouflages that support that. Um, is there a direct 
relation between the two. Can we say anything about how this color pattern, the spot, uh, the stripes evolved into the spots over this uh, period over these this last what fifty million years was it? Mm-hmm. No, it would be less what? than that. Thirty. No, no, 50, uh, 40. fifty. Yeah, uh, or is it the case that uh, a moonfish would? rapidly adapt to whatever its habitat was at the time so is it a a slow transition from our fossil moonfish to our modern moonfish or is it just though the just hundreds of species a, a new color pattern will arise to fit whatever habitat it's living in so i have to be honest that i don't know the uh precise answer here but we can work it out Uh, so what we know is that in the Eocene there were many different species of moonfishes living everywhere in the world at that time okay so the this family of moonfish it was called cosmopolitan because basically was living everywhere what's the problem here is that the fossil record again as often it's very patchy so in in Volca because it's a large state it's the first time that we basically have articulated skeletons and we do have evidence of soft tissues, color pattern and stomach content. But for the all other species of moonfishes, we have only few bones, you know, sometimes you get a cranium, but often it's very hard, you know, to even reconstruct the species, okay, where those uh, fossil remains um, belong. So, but by knowing that today we only have one single species from this family still living and they are restricted to the Indian Ocean or the Indo-Pacific Oceans, it suggests that it, there was something during this period of time, basically, from actually from the Paleocene to, to from the Paleogene, yes, to today that affected basically the evolution of moonfishes. They got restricted to a very specific area and only one species species survived. So it's kind of like a relic of a much bigger and more diverse family, if it makes sense. Mm. And, and we, we think, so in our paper, we discuss you know, possibilities and of how can we explain this shift in the coloration. And we think that probably it was obviously the change in the environment. So during the Cenozoic, there was a lot of you know, um, tectonic movements and there is a lot of, of you know, uh, changes at the level of, of the oceans, okay, and oceanographic in terms of currents and type of habitats that they were available, and you know they were changing very fairly, you know, quickly in, in a geological sense. So it is possible that moonfishes got slowly extinct from all different places, and only this uh, branch of the family survived by moving into this very restricted and specific area. And in terms, again, of, you know, adaptation, perhaps also genetic mutation might have affected the, the color that we see today. And this is kind of easy. You know, we, we, we saw by looking at like literature in uh, genetic studies that you need to tweak a couple of genes, actually, to just generate from stripes, you generate spots. So we think that perhaps even a genetic mutation might have caused the change or the shift in the um in the color pattern okay i was just looking to rule out you know like the you've got a a cosmopolitan uh moonfish back in the eocene they're all of a, a million different colors and patterns and it's only the spotted ones that survived to t- until today yeah. the only problem is that obviously we don't have we don't know if other moonfishes have different patterns they mm. maybe they were all striped you know or maybe they were all counter shaded and no pattern at all visible uh, or they were all different as you said living in different um environments in different places in the world that you can expect different patterns but we don't have that information unfortunately we have only one data point basically which is Borka and then we have the data point that is today so it's difficult to infer more you know to speculate more basically for sure but then I, I look at it the other way and I just think 
these conversations are only possible because you have that data point in Bolka that yes. allows you to look at coloration over millions of years and think about things in terms of their ecology and the evolution of the ecology. And I think it's just wonderful that you can do that just because yes. of the preservation in one place in Italy. It's oh, brilliant. yeah, no, it's incredible. And, you know, it's incredible to think about as well, you know, how what do we know about these patterns today, okay? Where do we see them and how can we understand how they function for that particular species, for example. So I said early that the stripes are more common in, in fishes that live in groups, okay, and they and they swim together. And this is called shoaling when the, the fishes, you know, they, they kind of swim independently and then something happens and they group together and they swim together. Uh, or they're called schools when they always live together. So they feed together, they swim together, whatever. Um, and this behavior has been hypothesized a long time ago to be, to appear for the, for the first time around the Triassic. So it would be really, really cool to find some exceptionally preserved fish from the Triassic with clear stripes, you know, just to say, yes, this is possible, you know, or even, even Permian, you know, some to say, no, actually this maybe happened even before the Triassic and maybe it was used for something totally different than what we know today. You know, it, it's a very, I don't know, very interesting to, to think about this stuff. Yeah, well, all Permian and Triassic fish researchers get in touch <laughs> if you yeah. have stripey fossils. <laughs> so what's going to be next for you? Are there more bulker fishes that have coloration that you can study, or are you just going to be off doing something completely different? Well, the, the, my door for bulka stuff, it's always open. <laughs> so there are definitely more specimens that have color patterns preserved. So it would be uh, very nice to keep this project going um, and keep looking again for either new species or species that we know they have relatives alive today and see if there are variation in color patterns or if, the, if we have stomach contents, for example, that can help us you know, um, infer or, or determine the, the, the diet of these ancient um, fishes. So for me, that's uh, an open project for anybody <laughs> they want to collaborate. Uh, otherwise, like my my project, my current project now is going to bring me to the more deep and dark taphonomy bits where we're going to investigate a little bit more the molecular taphonomy of melanin. Yeah, chemistry doesn't work well in audio, I've found. Oh, no. <laughs> no, we, we need visuals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe somewhere out there there's a chemo cast in a parallel universe have <laughs> yeah. gone that direction and we're talking about the difference between left-handed and right-handed molecules oh my God, of, yes. ugh, we need no. programs, you know we need that type of technology yeah <laughs> maybe in the future maybe in the not future. gonna rule it out no <laughs> so are there any other groups any other periods any other times that what we've discussed today these methods that we could apply that to and learn more about their ecologies well i would say that any any time period would really work i mean the the key things that you need is you know the soft tissue preserved the stomach content because it, it gives you at least the last meal you know uh, of, of of that organism or that fish in this case um so yeah, soft tissue, stomach contact. And if you, you know, if you have a, a relative that it's alive today, obviously that can also work and can help you again, you know, with this like train of thoughts about how that could be evolved or what's the function today against what was the function in the past. Uh, so really, you know, uh, there are so many options out there. All we need is the good fossils. Okay. And to anyone, any potential students that are listening to this, what would you tell them about your little niche in paleontology, little, your big niche in paleontology, uh, this intersection between how fossils are preserved, the taphonomy, and how fossils live, the paleoecology? Oh, I would say go for it. You know, if 
I think this is a very exciting field. Um, of course, there is a lot to learn, maybe a lot to, for this study, uh, a lot of lab work sometimes, um, but it is a great field. Uh, I, I strongly advise, you know, find a place that do this and go for it. So, Valentina, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall and Liz Martin Silverstone, with contributions from Tom Fletcher, Vish Venkat, and Elsa Pancharoli. Music was composed by Patrick Kendall Smith. Paleocast was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on funding from you, the listeners. So, if you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programs, and follow us across social media platforms to get all the latest news. Finally, if you enjoy our podcast, then please explore all of our video content on YouTube and follow our other projects, the Virtual Natural History Museum and the Paleocast Gaming Network.